Uh, hello, my name is Vincent McGovern. I'm a shared parenting campaigner for many years and in my voluntary duties I am also chair of Centre and North London branches of Families Need Fathers, a shared parenting charity. I, pre-COVID, would be dealing with over 900 attendees per year on average and my background is, shall we say, unusual for expertise in this business. On my next slide, you will see some of what I used to do for life. On the right hand side, on the white bike, that's me. And I spent nine years doing that between 1985 to 2004, England and Ireland. Sadly, the gentleman on the red bike died two years ago watching television. On the blue bike, which is my newest bike, it's only 19 years old, I go around various countries, and yes, that is my little dog in the box on the back of the bike. Because I spent many years as a motorbike courier, I spent 13 years as a motorbike courier based in London, and from 1998 until 2007, I was in the highly exalted position of being a house husband. So at 22 years of my life, riding motorbikes for a living, and changing nappies and looking after children. My introduction to this business was very forcible and most unpleasant. However, I had to move with the times. On the next slide, you will see more of what I am doing. Since 2007, I have had 43 hearings in my own case, many as a litigant in person. I was a McKenzie friend for 11 years attached to the family courts helping usually fathers attempt to have any sort of contact with their children. And in my private capacity, I have had five ombudsman's investigations in my favour into what I call child endangering, gender discrimination, throughout the entire system, basically, of the family court and support networks. Two of my parliamentary ombudsman's, that's the PHSOs, were into Kafka's, Children and Family Court Advisory Support Service an organisation I consider central to the failings of the family court process. Because of my expertise and background in official complaints, in 2014 the European Commission had a motion on systemic failings in the UK family court system and I was invited to address it. I discovered that my five minute presentation was suddenly reduced to one minute but that's what happens sometimes. And the second presentation, also meant to be five minutes in November 2014, became two minutes. If you go on to Family Seat Father's website and you go to the Central London branch section, and if you've lost the will to live, you can go to the second video that's on display there. And the first few minutes are interesting. And then there's 17 minutes of mind boggling tedium where the legal representative of the EU desperately tried to stop the investigation taking place. Wayne Reelan was the Children's Commissioner, absolutely brilliant man, and between him, us and a few others, this led to the first ever formal investigation into a sovereign nation's children's services by the EU Commission. It was quite a soft investigation, but nevertheless the Rubicon had been, caused, had been crossed. As an example of systemic failings, let me go to the next slide and demonstrate some of what I am talking about today. How fathers suffer from the gender implementation of domestic violence laws, the uh, rapid journey from father to non-resident parent, the typical father who comes to the Central London branch of Families Need Fathers, how the weapon of choice, increasingly the weapon of choice, it's no molestation ex parte. Ex parte means without notice. How government agencies turn fathers into outcasts. This leads to, you will be surprised to hear that there is consequences. The UK having the worst outcomes for children post-divorce or separation in European Union or Organisation of Economic Community Development, basically 37 first world nations. And then I pose solutions because there is no use complaining about something unless you bring, present a solution, a practical working solution. You will have a much better understanding of the discrimination in the system faced by fathers when I get to the next slide. For example, in 2016, we discovered that violence by women against men 
was included under statistics for violence against women and girls by the Crown Prosecution Service. Now, this is not some collection of clowns in the corner of a pub. This is the Crown Prosecution Service, officially discriminating in statistical evidence. It is difficult to comprehend in modern society how such discrimination can take place, but thanks to Ali Fogg for exposing this. In the next slides, I will present more evidence of the discrimination faced by men, particularly fathers. If we look, for example, at the 24-hour National Domestic Violence Helpline, free phone helpline, which I have contacted many years ago, I might add, we will discover that they are run by a combination of refuge and women's aid. If you look closer at the logos, you will see it is totally one gender only, women and children. The National Domestic Violence Helpline, despite the national title, does not help men. It will advise you to call a solicitor. There is no mention of men and boys in its logos, or in its constitution, or in its practice. The Brent Domestic Violence Advocacy Project and constitution and practice will only help female survivors of domestic abuse. This followed on from a freedom of information by myself, assisted by a very good member of Parliament, Barry Gardner, Brent North. It took eight months and the threat of a constitutional court before they would comply with their constitutional duties. In effect, what this means is that 50% of all parents, including male primary carers, are refused government-funded services due to gender. So straight away we see how the die is cast. We keep hearing about welfare of the child is a paramount consideration and half of all parents are deliberately discriminated against by government funded official agencies. By the government funded agency as in National Domestic Violence Helpline. If we go to the next slide we will see further evidence of how the system has been manipulated and much abused. LASPO stands for Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders. Just think of that. The ordinary father in family court is subject to LASPO. He's already described as requiring punishment and being an offender. That is how the interpretation and implementation is far too often. LASPO was enacted in 2013 and it was led to the removal of legal aid except for domestic violence is a feature. You will have seen from the National Domestic Violence Helpline and the local authority in Brent and many other local authorities that they'll only help female survivors of domestic abuse. So obviously the system is gamed from the very beginning. When legal aid only became available upon presentation of domestic violence as a feature. Unsurprisingly, this led to a huge increase in non-molestation orders ex parte. Ex parte means without notice. Non-molestation order means effectively that you're not allowed to have any contact with the party who's allegedly the victim, and allegedly is the operative term here. The Midlands, for example, had an 82% increase in non-molestation orders ex parte. And these figures are from the Legal Aid Statistics, July to September 2016. It did not take too long for such a huge increase in legal aid based on domestic violence to feature in the family courts. Yet, no such figures are presented by the police, crime reports, surveys, charities or accident and emergency. I give thanks to Richard Nixon, who is Chair of Crawley Family Seed Fathers, the brilliant blogger William Collins, uh, his illustrated Empathy Gap and his information on LASPO and the excellent Custody Minefield website which is owned by Michael Robinson. As an example of the changes in legal aid based on gender, pre-LASPO, depending on means, it was 40% female, 60%, 40% male, 60% female. Post-LASPO, it very quickly went to 15% male, 85% female. Domestic violence was the new game in town, massively increased. 
Further example of this on the next slide is the crude implementation of domestic violence. The British Crime Survey Home Office Statistical Bulletins in 2010 and 11, published by the Office of National Statistics in February 2012, shows that male victims are 35 to 50 percent of victims from female perpetrators. This figure has been known for decades with small variations. Yet, female victims are three times more likely to report to police. Women's Aid was unhappy that there were not sufficient injunctions against men because they had to provide some evidence. So in the summer of 2016, they brought in a revision, uh, a revision of a provision, if you like. The legal aid is also available for proceedings which provide protection from domestic abuse, with, with, such as protective injunction, without the need to provide evidence of domestic violence. Basically, all an unpleasant mother had to do was click her fingers, advised by the local agencies, and the father would be removed from the family home without any evidence. Can I also emphasize that in this process, the father is not informed of the evidence against him. He only receives the verdict reached on the evidence presented, normally, which is in the form of normalization ex parte, in a, an anonymous envelope handed to him. Your life is effectively over for many at that point. Now, I have a question to ask here. Not alone how would the public feel if any other group was so discriminated against. How would the public feel if those figures were reversed? You can just imagine the media attention this would receive and the shock horror. We have a situation now in British society where fathers and men are in the same situation as black men used to be during the sad era of Jim Crow in the southern states of North America. You're automatically guilty because guilt is determined by gender. Action is irrelevant. Many men attending the meetings talk about their rights, their rights to an equal trial, innocently proven guilty, and right to a family life. That is a fantasy for too many because they are believing Article 6 and Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. It is not absolute. It is qualified. It does not apply here. The violence against women and girls, an extraordinarily well-funded and a brilliant business model, does include men. Very comforting to know that. LGBT men can qualify for state-sponsored help. Effectively, heterosexual men, which is the predominance of fathers, are to be removed from the family unit and dumped in society. When you are desperate in this situation and you require assistance, you're always told if you're a victim of a crime, to go to a police station. So let's say you go into Wembley police station, my local police station. Although I emphasize, I've never frequented it as a prisoner yet. This police station reception area is dominated by a large poster, a picture on the right of the screen. It's got six telephone numbers and uh, the agencies mentioned above. Two of those numbers are our close friends, the National Domestic Violence Advocacy Helpline and the Brent Domestic Violence Advocacy Project. Both of them discriminate totally on grounds of gender and service provision. The other two are various forms of uh, Asian women's networks and there are two for the police who under the positive powers of arrest, if they're called to an incident of domestic violence, even if the man has called them, he will probably be the one arrested under their so-called positive powers of arrest. You have to understand that discrimination works best when it's cloaked with the guise of concern and beautiful language. As, as an example of the effect this has on people, uh, in the next slide you'll see a bit of humour. Now, I hope this gentleman has never requested the help of family seat fathers because I would be in trouble for putting this picture there. The picture on the left is a happy man. He's got normal life. Most men laugh a bit every day. Some, some laugh a lot, some laugh a little. 
The picture on the right is him coming out of court, not the family court, I hasten to add. But the picture on the right depicts the average man I have to deal with, and the other officers and families need fathers, although I'm speaking in a private capacity here. These people present at the meetings with greatly reduced facility. There's no confidence in society, in the systems. They're smashed by the introduction to the judicial process that is the family court and its pyramid structure underneath it. Many effectively drop out of society. Is it a surprise? Because everything they've believed in, that they have rights as equal citizens, that they're innocent until proven guilty, and they'll get a fair hearing in court, and that they will be kept involved with their children, it's all thrown away at one quick, quickie hearing far too often, where the whole evidence has already been established in secret against them. A lot of men do not have the wherewithal to challenge that effectively and survive. And that is one of the real tragedies. Because when you attack a father, you attack his children. Now, some may think that I'm being a bit extreme with my slides and the presentation. So, the next slide is a soft introduction to further evidence. And there's a happy middle-class father playing with his two children. The average father who comes to our meetings for help is not a happy middle-class father. Most of them are working class. In the gig economy, grey economy, call it whatever you like. One hour of a solicitor's time is probably a week of his take-home money. Possibly more. If he has been uh, through the wonders of the normalisation next party, he believes he's been a victim of miscarriage of justice and that MPs and everybody is going to sort this out for him. He believes in due process. Correction, he is desperately trying to believe in due process. He's got greatly reduced function. Many of them are in deep, deep shock and a great difficulty comprehending what is happening. I often say, if they're functioning at 50% of the intellectual capacity, they are unusual. It's quite often less than that in the beginning. We'll move on, and you will see the weapon of choice, normalization ex parte. Normalization order applications, I emphasize applications, not awards by men, post LASPO, are now 5 to 7 percent. This is recorded in July, September 2016. There are now three to four times as many applications and awards for legal aid citing domestic violence as a basis than there were in mid-2013 before LASPO was fully enacted. This came from the legal aid statistics. So there is absolutely irrefutable evidence of how the system has been gamed. And this is the central feature in parental alienation. Because I look upon that as being the greatest social crime of our times, where children are just used as weapons, where the vast majority of mothers, fathers too, of course, do it. Whoever has power abuses it too often in society. But the vast majority of mothers who in, get involved in this process, they want those children to love only them. They don't care what damage it does to the children because they believe that they are the ultimate. I don't have a problem with those women because there's always a section of people in society who aren't properly functioning. But I do want to cause it one hell of a huge problem to the systems designed to facilitate and promote this form of false allegations. It is a cruel industry and it needs desperately to be defunded and reformed. Moving on, we can see that Government agencies have highly advanced systems of turning fathers into outcasts. Kafka's Children and Family Court Advisory Support Service. Domestic Violence Intervention Project. Domestic Violence Perpetrator Program. And now their Domestic Abuse Perpetrator Program. Referred courses for domestic violence are for male perpetrators only. So the independent agency, that is the eyes and ears of the family court, all of whom are highly qualified social workers, in constitution and practice, insist that domestic violence can only be committed by men. This has been, 
This evidence has been procured by the excellent Brian Maloney of Cambridge Families Need Fathers. Let me talk a bit about Kafka's for a moment. I've had two parliamentary ombudsman's investigations in my favour into Kafka's. I'm the man responsible for them being forced to set up an official complaint system. Before this, they didn't have one. As far as I'm concerned, until Kafka's are reformed or removed, the situation for children in the UK is only going to go continually downwards. Their only duty is to assist the courts in the paramount welfare principle and to start off from a basis of total toxic gender politics. Those two do not match. A few years ago, domestic violence agencies were told that they needed to help male callers or they would lose some of their funding. In Wales, a helpline was set up to help male victims of domestic abuse. And a lady called Anna Regan became suspicious when her son approached him for help. This woman is a hard-working, capable woman, an ex-nurse, and she did some digging. I wish more people would do the same. And she established that only male callers to this helpline were screened they were not screened to see if they were victims, they were screened to see if they were perpetrators. So obviously she thought this was wrong, and she brought it to the Equality and Human Rights Commission in Wales, who, I quote, deemed it absolutely essential that male callers to the domestic violence helpline are screened to see if they are perpetrators. Talk about discrimination writ large. As Paula Preedy, the excellent chair of uh, Both Parents Matter, Family Street Fathers of Wales, has said, who the hell decided that women's aid was the best man for this job of dealing with male victims of domestic violence? But the protection of budget is priority to these organisations. Now, I talked earlier about parental alienation. All children who are alienated from one parent are victims of parental alienation. But 95% of the parents who are victims of parental alienation are dads. This is a direct line back to the normalization orders ex parte. It's not an accident that the figures coincide. A few years ago, I believe in November 2017, on the BBC programme, Victoria Derbyshire, a presenter on that programme, did a programme on parental alienation. Many of us in the shared parenting movement eagerly looked forward to it. We should have known better, but hope springs eternal. Our three children featured, who uh, were adults at this stage, two of them were alienated from the mothers, which is a crime as well. There was a short break for a newsflash, and one of the children alienated from the mother by the dad was re-featured. So any neutral person tuning in would believe that dads were doing the majority of the parental alienation yet they only have visits of the children 5% of the time. After that, I renamed the British Broadcasting Corporation the British Bias Corporation because such crude gender propaganda has got no place in any national institution. It makes a complete mockery of what a broadcasting duty is. If you think I am, shall we say, naive, are presenting a one-sided view. When we go to the next slide, I will keep quiet for 10 seconds. This is the official training on Coercive Control Act, which was brought in in 2015. Delivered by Dr. Bianca Jackson, Family Law Barrister at the Coral Chambers Law Works Domestic Violence Training on Coercive Control Act 2015. Delivered in uh, the premises of a large solicitor firm. And this is the training for barristers, solicitors, uh, social workers and our friends, the domestic violence advocates. The horrible photograph you see dominated every slide. You see there that a man has his mouth open and a muscular fist is coming out, smashing a woman in the face. When she's doing her introduction, 
Dr. Jackson was good enough to state that men too can be victims of <coughs> domestic violence. She had a cough as she said that. So sad. One of her lines was, you can check it on our website if you don't believe me. If a man is silent, he is coercive and controlling because he may become violent. What are the two important words there? Let me tell you. Man and violent. Because even if you're silent and doing nothing, you're still guilty. You're damned by your gender. So you may think, that's a very harsh photograph. It's a one-off. That line is a harsh line. Mm, men can become violent. You need to realize that even in debt, the man is owned as well. She said another statement that had me pale. And there's not much makes me pale. And that statement was this. If a man threatens suicide, he is controlling and coercive. So we can see that the National Domestic Violence Helpline, the local domestic violence agencies, social services, CAFCAS, the police, and the official training. Where can a man or a father go to for help? This is brutal discrimination against half of all parents in society. If we move on, we will see that this is not a victimless process. The UK has the worst outcomes for children post divorce and separation in the EU or OECD nations, the 37 first world nations. There's absolutely no surprise that this is happening. Even UNICEF is aware of this when it did a major a survey on expectations and outcomes for children post divorce and separation. And yet the system keeps becoming worse. As an example of what fathers have to deal with if they want to remain in their children's lives, the next slide gives a good indicator of the hostility they will face. The carpenter among you will recognize a hickory handled one and a half pound hammer. Sorry to be such a know-all, but I've used hammers very often in my work. And he is just a little ant that's going to get clobbered at some stage in this process. The local police, the local authority domestic violence services, the multi-agency risk assessment conference, social services, domestic violence agencies, all lead to the ex parte injunction and removal from the family home against fathers. Now we come to my favorite part of uh, this situation. Is there a solution? Because there's no use complaining about something unless you can present a solution. The solution has to be practical and ideally it has been tested and works. The family courts immediately should move from a position of close to zero regarding the enforcement of its own orders. For example, Hansard 2015, thanks to Suella Braverman, MP, reported that 1.24% of 4,654 applications for enforcement of an existing order, only 1.24% were enforced in 2015. Yet, we were told that every one of these orders were made in the best interest of the child. I can guarantee you that many of those orders took five plus hearings and tens of thousands of pounds quite often if you could afford it. And yet this is the amount of enforcement of the actual orders. This makes a complete mockery out of judicial process. What other business would be allowed to exist? with a 98.7% rate of failure. It is absolutely staggering and totally unacceptable. And they, the judiciary for this flaccid rulings, are a major reason for children suffering so much in society. It is estimated at the moment that one in, of every eight children has a mental health disorder. I'm not at all surprised. The Centre for Social Justice, some years ago, estimated that £49 billion is the average cost of family breakdown in the UK. You have to understand that for many people in the system, this is good because they earn a living from it. For example, when I was at the European Parliament in 2014, 
after my first presentation, I was introduced to a few MEPs with a deep interest in children's matters. I learned more in that short conversation than I've ever learned. Three particular sentences stand out in my mind from these female MEPs. One sentence was, it is obvious that in the UK, the welfare of the child means the welfare of the professional at the expense of the child. That's a an MEP. I have never heard it better described, ever. Just think of that. The more damage and distress and disturbance there are for children, the more professionals earn a living on the back of it in this depressing, toxic system. If you want to say I am anti the system because I'm an ignorant man, you're wrong on the second one. I'm not an ignorant man because I've got five almost months investigations against these very professionals. If you look at what happened to Professor Ireland when she investigated the experts, and that should be in red ink, brackets, a small case, the experts in the family court, the extraordinary amount of percentage of them who were unqualified or who were presenting evidence but totally unskilled in. They didn't try to get her removed. This is an example of the institutional failings as well at the top level. So you have it at the bottom level, domestic violence agencies and so on, and you get to the top level, you don't get much better. There are some excellent judges in the system, there are even some good Kafkas and social workers, but they're in an absolutely deplorable system. The quicker this system is reversed, the better. If you go to the next line, next uh, slide, once again, we're talking about the deadly toll of relationship breakdown. There were 4,110 male suicides in 2016 in the United Kingdom. That's 13 a day. 75% of all suicides are men. The biggest boom is the 40 to 50 year olds. 34% of male suicides are driven by relationship breakdown. With the system I have presented evidence to you on the previous slides, I'm surprised it's not a higher figure. Separated dads are 300% more suicide prone. Once again, I'm surprised it's not a higher figure. Homeless figures, 95% are men. Which parent gets residence of the children? 95% are not men. Who gets the normal station ex parties issued against them? 95% are men. Is this figure an accident? Is it hell? It is an absolute inevitable consequence of institutional malpractice. The prison population, where did they predominantly come from? Separated families. The knife crime. Teenage pregnancies. County lines. No father around. They've got alternative means of enjoying life. This was done in an article by Martin Dobney for the Daily Telegraph. He tells me it is the most shared article he's ever done. And if anyone meets him, please tell him to hurry up and get my book published because he's supposed to be doing it for the last two and a half years. Anyway, Martin, rev up and get the book done. Let's move on a bit. Because we cannot just dwell on negatives. I talked earlier about solutions, proven solutions, tested solutions. So, for example, would it be too much to get the EU average for children's outcomes, get the UK to match the EU? I see no reason why that cannot be halfway achieved in five years and on par within ten years. There has to be a cultural change, of course. There has to be defunding of organisations that indulge in what I call child endangering gender discrimination. We need the welfare of the child to be the overriding aim, not just a mission statement of convenience for funding. In the UK in 2013, only 57% of 15 year olds are living with the father. When I say living with the father, that means whether he's separated from the mother and has accommodation or is living with the mother at home. 
It is estimated that 50% projected by 2020. I can assure you that figure has been met. In Finland, the figure for 15-year-olds living with their father is 95%. And the OECD average is 85%. This is from the Labour Force Survey Online Office of National Statistics. I want to talk about Finland for a moment. Finland at the moment as a government, that's a five-party coalition. Every party is led by a woman. The Bahrain legislation recently that actually copper fastens father's rights to a proper relationship with their children, which gives the children proper rights. So here we have a country where only 2% of cases end up in courts because the default position is 50-50 share of parenting. And you have infinitely better outcomes for children in a small frozen nation. The UK is a G7 nation, still one of the most important economic nations in the world. Now, if you want to know about this business, you had better go to he who presented the encyclopedia on this, Nick Langford, author of the excellent book, An Exercise in Absolute Utility, and also Injuria WordPress. There is no use talking about a situation if you don't understand the systemic failings within it, the causative factors that has led to it being the way it is, and the solutions that need to be presented. Because otherwise you have a complete vacuum of knowledge. And a vacuum of knowledge is something I want to help you with. So if you move to the next slide, you will see that I mentioned Nick Langford's book and exercise and absolute fertility. This is by far the best reference book I've ever come across. But you will be very surprised to hear not one mainstream publisher would touch it. That is a shattering indictment of institutional failings to protect children. They should hang their heads in shame. We also get to William Collins and his excellent of his many blogs, but this one illustrated empty gap on LASPO, legal aid, sentencing and punishment of offenders. You will get many men in the system, not who are victims, I assure you, who will say that, and politicians, oh, of course to support shared parenting for safe to do so. The most mealy mouthed expression impossible. Does the public know that if you look up coroner's inquests and serious case reviews by the social services, you will discover that more children are killed while in the care of the mother than in the care of the father. Women's Aid launched a programme a couple of years ago, 19 child homicides, trying to demonstrate that fathers having access to their children via court orders was killing children. When at the same length of time, more children were killed by the mothers than by the fathers. This is an example of deliberate, deliberate misinformation. Those who peddle such misinformation, known it is misinformation, should at the very least be prosecuted for hate crimes. Uh, they should never ever be allowed in any capacity where children are involved because they are a total danger to vulnerable children. The greatest brain I know in this business and an absolute giant in this business is Erin Pitsy and she was good enough to give me a copy of her book This Way to the Revolution when we first met. What that woman doesn't know isn't worth talking about. But yet you look at the way she was treated on Sky TV a few years ago by Kay Burley, the presenter. She was treated absolutely dismissively and in a disgusting manner for any human being, let alone an, old, an older lady of unparalleled intelligence and ability to impart it. This is the systemic corruption in society. The dads can only be violent, brutal men, the patriarchal privilege which is just a flag of convenience for purest bigotry. It is nothing else but bigotry, a lot of this. Now, I am a modest man, as you have obviously gathered, and my own book, which is a waste publication, hurry up, Martin, is entitled The War on Dads and Children. Subtitle, How to Fight It and Win. Because I've had five ombudsman's investigations, three parliamentary. I've also stopped a slush fund in Brent, and they've also caused an offset investigation into the local children's services, 
which, may I quote, the local paper described it as utterly damning. Okay, papers are papers. Now, if someone like me, who spent 22 years of my adult life riding motorbikes and looking after children for a living, what are the rest of men doing in society? There are only a few people in this business who are really fighting. Mike Buchanan has a long, honourable record battling against huge odds. Name another man of a political party who is fighting? I can't think of one. So we are forever told that the manosphere is peopled by dads with unlimited anger against women. They're no use to society. That is just the demonization of a gender. Because anyone with any knowledge of warfare knows that before you get people to go to war, you have to have an enemy. And the only way the average person will attack someone else is if they believe that that other person is overwhelmingly bad. Because it's human nature to get rid of what's bad. So let's make it simple. We need to remove the child endangering gender discrimination from these excessively grotesquely funded agencies and their business model. The ideology you will not remove. But the power you have to remove, because their funding gives them power. They're in the advisory groups to Parliament. They, in fact, they completely stack the advisory groups. Since 2013 with LASPO, we've had coercive and control legislation brought in. We've had practice direction 12J brought in, which prohibits litigants in person who are accused of domestic violence if they're male from cross-examining the accuser. So much for Article 6 and the right to a fair trial. As for Article 8 and the right to family life, that is an absolute mockery because forever we are told that the welfare of the child is paramount. How on earth can the welfare of the child be paramount with a 98% failure rate at enforcing their own orders? I emphasise I'm a shared parenting advocate. I hope many more follow me and do better than me. Thank you.